But I don't, I really don't have any regrets. I really don't. I've, I've lived exactly how I've wanted to. I've tried my hardest every single time. I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won. Or, but I really gave it my all. So that for me is enough. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Body Serve. I'm Jonathan. And I'm James. We did not expect to be here today, this fine Saturday of this fine leap year, the 29th of February. We thought we had the weekend off. I thought we had bought ourselves a little bit of time doing that mailbag episode, but Maria Sharapova decided to upend our brief break Mm -hmm. and announce her retirement from tennis. Let's not do a whole long preamble about this. We're here because Maria Sharapova has retired, and we're here to talk about that, to situate her career, talk about the the ups and downs of her career, and put her career and her into some context. She announced this week via an essay that she wrote for Vanity Fair and Vogue, which were released at the same time, both Condé Nast publications. It's the sort of flex that only a player of her magnitude can do. It's been interesting to me to watch her over, I would say, probably the past year or a little more and and observe how little attention and how little fanfare has followed her around, considering that she was once the highest paid female athlete in the world. She was tennis's biggest superstar for, for many years. And this latter stage of her career has been quiet. When you say only a player like her, obviously... Serena can do that too, and now Naomi can do that too. I think those are the three players in women's tennis who have that kind of stature, status, to be able to call up Anna Wintour and be like, hey, can I, <laughs> can I let y'all know in your publication? Mm. Well, regardless of who can do it, the point is that Maria is bigger than tennis in the same way that Serena or Roger or Rafa or Novak are bigger than tennis. They don't have to go through the traditional tennis media to do these things. They can call on their sponsors, their friends, mainstream press. They have that freedom that's afforded them because they are successful and they make a lot of money. Of course, I knew what you meant, but I think dealing with a complicated figure like Maria Sharapova, <laughs> it's incumbent on us to be as precise as we can with our words so as to not open up ourselves okay. to, to troll them. But we're not doing this the whole episode. You know, every every statement about Maria is not an equal statement about Serena. Like, we're just, no, that's no. tiresome. I agree. I'm just saying we can easily cause nothing to be more precise. Oh, okay. You see what you did there? You put me in a position to be the bad person mm-hmm. again. Well, maybe you shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't do it. Anyway, Maria wrote this essay... I think there were probably a few journalists and people within the sport who knew it was coming. And we can't really see it as a massive surprise considering that her body has been betraying her over the past few years. It's been extremely difficult for her to stay healthy at this point for even a match or two in a row. Her events have been sparse. It seemed that the writing had been on the wall for a little while. What's interesting to me is that There is no retirement tour. There's no final triumphant moment at a Grand Slam that meant a lot to her. There's no on-court farewell. It it almost seems, um, I know I used the word quiet before, but it it just seems a little anticlimactic for somebody who has meant so much to the game for the past 15 years. Sure, but to me it makes sense because to, to embark on some kind of farewell tour you'd have to be able to count on your body to allow you to show up for it. Right. And I think that's what the bottom line is here for Maria. She told this story in her Vanity Fair Vogue essay that just getting on court for her match at the U.S. Open last year felt like a victory. Getting the shot in her shoulder, and if it was cortisone or whatever, but just being able to play, Mm -hmm. to numb the shoulder and play in a first round was a big achievement. And so she was past the point of being able to plan anything tennis related because her body just wouldn't let her. Right. And I don't think she's the type to be like, well, let me just show up for this first round, have a cute little moment and lose 6-2, 6-2. Like, Mm, that's not the kind of scripting that she would want. No. 
And she's had an interesting career injury-wise because after that big shoulder surgery that she went through that had really compromised her play, she had to rewrite the way that she served. Her game looked quite a bit different than when she was 17, 18, 19 years old. She learns how to move on clay. She wins two French Opens. She becomes a dominant player again. Well, maybe not a dominant player, but she reaches number one again. She's part of this triumvirate for a little while with Serena and Azarenka, all the while dealing with this shoulder issue that is still very much a problem. It's not just that she won the French Open. She was winning tournaments on clay. Yeah. her Up until 2010, I believe, she had won or made just one final on clay, and it was green clay at Amelia Island. Mm. But from 2010 onwards... You see Maria making a ton of clay finals. In fact, the majority of her finals that she makes, I believe, in the second half of her career, come on clay, winning Stuttgart three times and winning Rome three times. So that's, like you said, a complete change of course from what we we conceived of her to start her career. Mm-hmm. So where do you want to start here? Do you want to talk about her career on the court and just kind of give a little background where she started, where we are now? And then, I mean, the extracurricular things are a huge story with Maria, as always. I want to talk about first about her influence. One of the things that I've seen since the the announcement that she's retired is some folks scoffing at just how much her actual influence was and uh, how much she inspired people. And I don't think you can underestimate just how much influence Maria Sharapova had in bringing people into tennis. It might not be the reasons that you would want people to come to tennis, but (laughs) Maria Sharapova is bar none, globally, the most well-known women's tennis player. And we know this because Jamaicans don't know what Serena Williams looks like. We know this from School's (laughs) Challenge Quiz. (laughs) But I can't tell you how many times I've interacted with people and they're like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I have a tennis podcast. And like, oh, um, Maria Sharapova? I'm like, do you follow tennis? No. But they know who Maria yeah. Sharapova yeah. is. Her persona has cut through so many different facets of life to the point where random people know who she is. On top of that, there are a lot of people who the very first match they saw was a Maria Sharapova match. And that's the kind of thing that you can't control. I was a Conchita fan because the very first match I watched was a Conchita match. The very first men's match I watched was an Agassi match. You know, those are the things that that people hang on to because it's their their first introduction, right? So there's that. There's the fact that she occupied this place of prominence, being the top-paid female athlete in the world for so long. We can have a totally different discussion about whether that was warranted or deserved. That's separate and apart. If you're able to separate those two things, then I think you can see clearly that Sharapova meant a lot to a lot of people and had great influence within the tennis world, the sporting world, and in society at large, globally as well. Within tennis, she is a polarizing figure. We are not going to pretend like we have always been kind to her on the show. We've had our fun roasting Maria over the years. You've had your fun today with the title for this episode. (laughs) And, you know, I'm going to be totally straightforward. Maria is not not a player that I loved to watch play tennis. I can appreciate her place. I respect a lot of things about her. She's not somebody whose matches I flock to watch. And we've been critical about the way that she wrote about Serena in her book, about you know, how she handled the ITF and then WADA ban, and there's a lot going on. But she is not a a boring character by any stretch. If you were to look back now on Maria's career, what is the one word or the one thing that comes to mind? Well, well, unfortunately, right now, it's Meldonium. That's the first thing that comes to mind? Yeah, like if we're doing plain word association. I'm not saying that's fair. Okay. But... I think when we have some distance, when I've been thinking about her career, I'm thinking about winning Wimbledon at 17, thinking about having a career slam, uh, Sugar Pova. Her tennis achievements are huge because very few women have won a career grand slam. Her off-court achievements are also big. And they're also painted by the fact that 
her blondness and her whiteness made her the perfect foil and the perfect heroine as opposed to this dominant black champion, Serena Williams, you know. She was the great white hope. Right. Again, another iteration of the great white hope. Mm. For me, the word is complicated. Sure. When we covered the Meldonium thing, we came down right in the middle of the fence. We didn't come down on either side of the fence. And I think I'm still there, actually. It was kind of interesting to go back and look through some of the, the research that we had done for that episode. What? Like, what? Three years it ago was in, at this point? Um, early 2016 when it when it came out. So almost four years ago, we would have mm-hmm. covered this on the show. And to now be going through it again or thinking about it again and and feeling the same way. Like not much has changed for us. Well, let's let's look at complicated. So we can get into the, the Meldonium thing later on. But something about Sharapova that I find fascinating is the the outside perspective of her. I feel, is very, very different from the real Maria that we saw playing tennis, right? Like, she was marketed as this blonde bombshell, this perfect beauty, a mysterious Russian, but her game on court was not beautiful. It was gritty. She was known to be a workhorse. She gutted out matches in ugly ways. Like, she knew how to win without making beautiful tennis. And I think... That that contradiction, like at the heart of her game and her public image, is what I find very interesting about her. Because she's a fight, like she's a boxer on court, really. Like she's not a glamorous tennis player. But because of who she is, and because of her intelligence, and sort of this enigmatic nature about her, I think she was able to be super successful as a businesswoman and as an image. Like there's a this construction of what Maria Sharapova is, there's a concept That is quite different from what she looks like on court. I think there are many different Maria Sharapovas. There's that grit, that unvarnished boxer-like Maria on court. There's the professional in the press room that knows how to work a media room that shows up and does that work. You know, she's very well Mm -hmm. respected in the media room. There's the Maria who plays into the blonde bombshell starlet. Mm Mm-hmm. We'll get into that more later on because that's all kind of fucked up how that started. And then I think there's another Maria, uh, the personal Maria in her private life that we don't really get to see ever. Right. I think that's the unknowable Maria. To me, she actually comes off as quite guarded because she does the media thing well. She's quippy. She's funny. Sometimes she can be quite prickly, but she always gives you something in press and On the the international stage, when she's, you know, accepting a runner-up trophy or something, she's always gracious. There's never tantrums. She's not somebody who smashes rackets. Like, she is very self-contained as a star. But who Maria Sharapova is, I don't really have any idea. No, I don't think anybody outside of her friends know. Right. (laughs) Which is is cool if you're able to sustain that as such a big star. You know, if you're able to protect that part of yourself. On court Maria, business Maria, by business I mean Sugar Pover, her businesses, press Maria, and then private Maria, which is unknown to us. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about her career a little bit. She comes on the scene as kind of a gangly, young, hard hitting player. I think I first heard about her in maybe like late 2003. In early 2004, people are touting her as. A potentially next great champion and she gets within the top 20 and then absolutely stuns Serena Williams the number one player the two-time defending champion at Wimbledon that was the second time sets. that they played they played earlier in the spring with Serena winning that match mm. and then they get to Wimbledon and it's a straight set straight set win for Sharapova. right and it she mentioned in her essay it didn't really sink in for her how momentous that that occasion was and I think a lot of people probably saw their first tennis match in the 2004 Wimbledon final, or they certainly saw their first Sharapova match with her beating Serena like that. Mm-hmm. Serena, who was 2004, wasn't as great, but she was not far removed from the first Serena slam. She was still seen as a dominant champion, but as we know now, is entering this phase that is a very, very difficult phase in her tennis career. And that gives a slight opening for Maria to become the next genuine star. At that time, Serena was, what, 22, 23 years old? Mm. And 
one would have thought at least have her career done at that time. And here's mm-hmm. this new champion coming to upend her, as we were told. This new great white hope. And for as much as we look for rivalries in women's tennis, this was one that could have been. And it's what people held on to that it could be even as recent as like a few years ago. Because mm. there's so much built into it organically from its onset, from the very first year of this head-to-head that, that made it ripe to blossom into something momentous. It right. did. It, it just did. so happened that it ended up being very unkind to Maria. Mm-hmm. It certainly was a rivalry because it was appointment viewing regardless of of the outcome. But in 2004, we see another match between Serena and Maria. Maria wins at the WTA Championships, and we got a real problem on our hands, right? Well, <laughs> if you you're, get, you get if to, you're a Serena fan. You get to Australia the next year, and has Maria has points. match points, plural. And Serena is able to beat her in that semifinal, and then... And then beats Lindsay Davenport in the final. And she never loses to Maria Sharapova ever again. Right. So I, I kind of reject, I, I understand the argument that this is not a rivalry because it was so lopsided, but it was certainly compelling viewing. Not every match was. Serena won every subsequent match, but there was something, you know, you can't, you can't invent this stuff. There are some rivalries between players that have a lot of great matches, and they're just not as interesting as this. Mm-hmm. Like, this dynamic could not be beaten. And there was... At certain points, some personal animosity between them. Not always. Like, it flared up every once in a while in 2012 with that Rolling Stone thing. Other times on the court, they were kind of laughing and joking with each other. They certainly were not friends. Well, as Maria said, there's no reason why they shouldn't be friends. (laughs) We've had so many of the same experiences. Yes, girl. (laughs) But uh, I think Maria's career was interesting. Because you could have seen her dominating for a few years serena was kind of in a lull in her career in the you know 04 05 06 venus was killing the girls at wimbledon sharapova ran into that buzzsaw the year that she was going to defend her title in 2005 maria wins the u.s open in 2006 she's also fighting against clysters and enna Mm -hmm. as these great champions so this was a, a rich time in women's tennis And the performance that really sticks out to a lot of people is that 2008 Australian Open, which truly is one of the most dominant Grand Slam runs that I can think of in the past 15, 20 years. She plays kind of a murderer's row of opponents, Bagels, three of them, Bagels, Vesnina, Dementieva, and number one, Justin Enna. And then she beats number three and four, Jankovic and Ivanovic in the semis and the final. She also beat... Coming back from pregnancy, Lindsay Davenport in round two and kind of killed her. I want to go back to the very start. Tamani Cariel tweeted something this week after the announcement by Sharapova saying something to the effect of the way that folks used to talk about and talk to Sharapova as a 16-year-old was wild. Mm -hmm. And when you read the transcript, it's, it's sad. It's depressing. It's extremely disturbing how this sort of language is normal. Yeah. Like, who who in 2004 batted an eye at that line of questioning where I'm assuming a lot of these British men are asking Maria, as a 16-year-old, how does it feel to be the next blonde bombshell to save women's tennis? Like, this is Mm -hmm. quite literally a child. If you look at Maria's face in 2004 with that trophy... Like, this is a girl. Right. And you're asking her what it's going to be like. Are you ready to be the sex symbol, to to carry the torch from Anna Kornikova? And so this idea that Maria is and has always been this calculating minx, almost, it's more than a bit unfair to me knowing where she came from and what she started with. Mm -hmm. You know, like, she's somebody who came from nothing, essentially. Her father brought her to the States to become a tennis star and sacrificed everything. They had very little. And then she's put in the... She's put herself in this position now where she's a burgeoning tennis star, and who could fault her for trying to capitalize on that? But at the same time, it's all kinds of fucked up. Mm. So here's some of the questions, for your reference. 
Nevertheless, how prepared are you to fill the Kornikova gap? She doesn't seem to quite grasp, grasp the line of questioning. In which way was it special to win what the British tabloids call the Battle of the Babes? Was it special playing against Ashley? That's Ashley Harkle Road. What's the biggest difficulty with certain looks and a certain ability to keep concentrated on the sport? And again, with certain looks and abilities in tennis, what's difficult to keep concentrated on the sport? This is, you see this person dancing around the true meaning of this question so much that Maria doesn't even understand what's being asked. And she, she doesn't grasp it throughout the, the press conference. Until this questioner said, what's the danger not to be distracted from playing tennis when you've got certain looks and certain abilities? Again, that's three times the same exact phrase about her looks. Certain looks. What, and what, are, what are the certain right. looks? So this is like the euphemistic, gross line of questioning that was given to a 16-year-old girl at the time, which reading it and looking at her responses, I felt terrible because she clearly wasn't following where the person was going. You see it still? It's predatory. It's pedophilic. Frankly. It, yeah. I mean, this, that's was, what it, this is a Lolita thing. This was a, a few years removed from an underage Britney Spears posing on the cover of Rolling mm -hmm. Stone in a bathing suit. The Catholic girl fantasy. like The male gaze being put up on a 16-year-old in this instance is disgusting. Right. So Maria's career is, uh, for better or for worse, whether she liked it or not, kind of sh shrouded in that. And predicated on it, in a sense. Right. Much of her success is based on sex appeal. And so you have this great white hope who has been granted this pedestal of sex appeal that's going to open all these avenues and markets and doors that are closed to the actual top female tennis player, mm -hmm. Serena Williams. This is where the compare and the contrast and the fraught relationship between the two begins, whether they have a role in it or not, right? Right. Because Serena is the best. She's won the Serena Slam. She is on, on her way, but yet her body is not preyed upon in the same way, which sounds so fucked up because that's what it boils down to, right? Mm -hmm. Like these young women, <laughs> there's a certain ideal that elevates Maria Sharapova over Serena Williams, regardless of ability. Right, and this is not meant to patronize Maria Sharapova, because she's obviously been quite clever and quite smart in the business world, and using her image and her success on court, and leveraging that toward success elsewhere. It's not to take away from, from her, but this is the reality we're in, right? She garnered such attention from a young age, for this mm -hmm. obvious reason. And if you wonder why so many of Serena's fans are preternaturally disposed to be against Maria Sharapova and are so vehemently and vocally nasty to her sometimes, this is where it this comes from. part of it, yeah. It's, yeah. it's personal in that regard because that kind of access and privilege that is cut off to Serena that that she is not able to to reap the benefit of that's something that people can relate to and so mm -hmm. fans of tennis see this happening in real time and then those battle lines are drawn and so while we are able to sit here and be a little bit you know objective about it I can understand when some folks are not able to be right. that way right you know right. when issues of whiteness and blackness are are coloring the tennis and these two women and their rivalry and and the way they interact, it becomes it becomes vicious. And it wasn't helped by the book Unstoppable. And when that came out, me and a lot of other people viewed it as this unwillingness of Maria to really engage with that. Because, you know, she's lived in the United States for many, many years, her entire adult life now. I don't expect her to, to be an expert on American racial politics, but yeah. she does have to understand a little, or at least listen, when people explain like what structural racism is, you know, and how ideals about white femininity have have sort of given her an advantage where black women have a an extreme disadvantage, mm -hmm. you know. And sure, Serena is probably one of the pettiest people on earth. We know this, but <laughs> when Maria writes, you know, there's really no reason why we shouldn't be friends girl like this is partly why 
this is the that that aloofness and this not really engaging in what's really at play here the the racial component is being completely overlooked mm-hmm. so it's not about it's not like a matter of ex- apologizing for your success but it is acknowledging the dynamics that are at play so we talked about why the serena maria rivalry was fraught from the start like what were the underpinnings of this whole situation what made it complicated and then we get to meldonia mm-hmm. okay so we have to talk about it right because a, a lot of the reason people think maria's legacy is complicated is because of the positive test for meldonium and the subsequent ban for 15 months it uh you know it has allowed people to call into question her achievements while using this drug which for the vast majority of the time was allowed and her integrity right can i just stop for a second and say i've been to square one mall in toronto maybe five times in mississauga excuse me okay in mississauga five times tops in the what nine years now we've been living in toronto and twice huge maria news has happened upon me visiting while that you mall. were at the mall the co- the press conference happened <laughs> while i was at square one mall i stopped my shopping and sat down on a bench beside this elderly gentleman eating his tim hortons and was taking that all in because we thought like maybe a retirement was coming then right oh yeah everybody thought it was a retirement yeah and so this news happened what on tuesday on monday i was at square one mall mm. interesting so uh, apologies to Maria fans. So what happens next time you go to Square One? <laughs> I, I don't know. I try to stay out of Mississauga as much as possible. And shopping malls. Period. Right, right. Anyway, as it, we're, you know, I had to sort of reacquaint myself with the facts of the case because it has been a while, longer than I remembered. But meldonium was added to the banned substance list by WADA on January 1st, 2016. Maria tested positive for it at the Australian Open, which was later in January. So it was a matter of a few weeks. It had been on kind of this watch list. I think they call it, it was a monitored drug for several years because they were trying to figure out, I guess, what its effects were. But it was finally banned on January 1st, 2016. She tested positive. It was obvious that she didn't know because she wouldn't have taken it so freely. By freely, you mean popping like six or seven pills before she played Serena at that Australian Open. Right, right. And what it does is it dilates the blood vessels, and it's an anti-ischemic, it's called. Like, it's for heart patients. And it can have some, you know, potentially beneficial effects for athletes like uh, endurance or lung capacity or whatever. Better blood circulation, that kind of thing. And the meldonium lobby is out there in full force because we still don't know the full 100 as to its true efficacy right right it may not actually be that effective as a performance enhancer for athletes it is but in russia it's kind of seen as like oh yeah you can buy that in any pharmacy over the counter so it's not a big deal in the u.s and the the west people didn't know what it was all they knew was that it was banned Mm -hmm. Um, and you could not get it over the counter in the u.s no But you could get it freely in Russia, right? And so Maria, who was a U.S. national at that point, but still representing Russia for Fed Cup, you would think that her home base is where all her doctoring was happening. But she was getting her meldonium from Russia. Right. So there there are a few weird things about it. Obviously, the, the initial ITF ruling was draconian, and it birthed what is now a legendary quote in tennis, that she is, quote, the sole author of her own misfortune that will live in infamy. But there, you know, there are still some odd things about the Meldonium case that I don't believe that her fans have have answered fully. And make no mistake, Meldonium is a huge stain on her career, whether she likes it or not. Right, and whether it's fair or not. Yeah. Right? So she was prescribed this drug by her family doctor, and she had been taking it for years, she parted with that doctor, but continued to take it without any medical intervention. She was just kind of on her own taking meldonium without a doctor saying you should. She also stopped listing it on her doping control forms for about three years, which was weird. Like, nobody has answered that question fully, in my perspective. Then Max Eisenbud misses an email 
she blames him, the ITF blame him and Maria, and that's that. Now, forever, forever and always, she will be an athlete who failed the doping test. Whether or not you agree that it should be banned or that the circumstances were fair. There are all these Facebook notifications, these pamphlets with fine print that were glossed over. So the Court of Arbit Arbitration for Sport reviewed her case, she appealed it, and they upheld part of her appeal. They reduced the ban to 15 months. They found that the ITF ruling went way too far, found that she did not endeavor to hide her use of meldonium, which is evidenced by her taking it at the Australian Open uh, freely. You know, if she actually knew that it was illicit, most likely she would not have done that. And they accepted that it was a good faith belief that Maria was using it because it was beneficial and legal. So that's where we are. But the, the complication is that when she comes back from the suspension, her results are not where they were. And that's, that can be explained by a lot of things. It can that, be explained by injury. Right. That she's a professional athlete in her late 20s, early 30s at that point, had not been playing professional matches for over a year. Her shoulder was already a serious problem before, but if you're someone inclined to not believe her, this is good ammunition. Mm -hmm. This, Her results after her suspension can give you that ammo to say, wow, that meldonium really helped her a lot. It makes for a good joke or two. Right. right? Uh, I just don't think you can retroactively litigate somebody's intent when there's so much murkiness with this mm -hmm. issue. And so I'm hesitant to sit here and say, well, Maria is a clear-cut doper and that all of her results prior to the suspension should be wiped away as some people thought they should, as some people still think they should. Mm. I mean, Maria Sharapova and Agar Radvanska were vocal about it. I saw someone the other day call her the biggest cheater in tennis, which to me is absolutely wild because you literally have people banned for testosterone right now like as we speak like real steroids that actually do shit <laughs> masking know? agents all I mean, this other no stuff. we we have actual cheaters out here we have people who call the wrong lines you know the the history of tennis is full of assholes the so let's not be a uh, histrionic here the history of professional sport is littered with baseball players cricketers, you name it. I firmly believe that if something is legal, professional athletes will try it. Yes, yes. And they have. And, and and if something is illegal, but they find a way to cover it up, they will also try that. And so where I think this becomes a little bit much is the draconian nature with which folks want to paint Maria as absolutely this one thing, this doper, this cheater. For me, I view it with a little bit more nuance. I understand if you cannot. <laughs> you know, like, right, right. I get it. I get it. I think where we're at in, in kind of wrapping up this Maria retrospective is that she contains multitudes. She is a very complicated figure. She will continue to be a polarizing figure in our sport. At the end of the day, she's still a five-time Grand Slam champion. Yeah. She did things that folks never expected her to do, namely win two French Opens, become a clay... Really, a, a killer. Yeah, I was going to say expert, but maybe not quite. But like, for somebody to be able to learn how to slide on clay and master that surface later on in their career is not nothing. Like, that's <laughs> that's quite the achievement. No, there's there's a lot to respect about Maria's career on court about her professional attitude, about her focus, which is intimidating in itself, her focus on court. Um, she wrote in the essay announcing her retirement that one of the keys to my success is that I never looked back and I never looked forward. And that sounds like a sport cliche, but in her case, I actually believe it. If you watch some of these three set wins where she showed no finesse, like <laughs> very little evidence of a plan B or C, but managed to convince herself that she could win this match. And mm -hmm. she did it so many times in the 2010s. I do believe that, that when she was on court, she was focused on the, the present. And that's something that, uh, that I, I admire a lot. 
Another bit of comparison that rubs folks the wrong way with respect to Serena and Maria, again, their careers are inextricably tied, is this whole business of her being intimidating. You just called her intimidating. How many people call her intimidating? Right. We hear Serena's intimidating every time she, ta- mm. she takes the court, when in fact, there haven't been many more intimidating players on a tennis court than Maria Sharapova based on how she presented herself. Yeah. The Maria death stare on a tennis court, how is that not intimidating? Mm-hmm. But as with so many things in tennis, it's racialized. Right. I mean, Serena would kill you, scream in your face, and then come to the net and give you a little pat on the head and have a little conversation and, you know, say you're such a sweet girl. Maria was all business, all the time. A few of her best quips. Check her blood pressure. <laughs> LA up your fucking ass. <laughs> That's it. I mean, I love that. Let one. me tell you, I that was in a period I really did not like her. But that is brilliant. It'll be because the Roland Garros crowd deserved it. Mm-hmm. It'll it'll linger. <laughs> that one. She won those five Grand Slams. She made ten Grand Slam finals. She's one of what seven women to win the career Grand Slam. In the Open Era, one of 12 to have won at least five Grand Slams. This in a career that was interrupted by injury and suspension, and a career that lost so many slams and playing time. That coupled with her reach and the the eyes that she brought to tennis and her stature, she is somebody who will be missed. You may not feel it as much now because... She hasn't really been around much in the last couple of years and hasn't done much in the last couple of years, but her legacy is substantial. Now, don't let us change your mind about Maria. This is our take, and that's that. I'm sure there are plenty other tennis podcasts and tennis publications where you can go to find that other stuff that you're looking for. <laughs> we apologize if we have not given that to you. Results! Tennis has been happening. Results! Last week, we had a bunch of tournaments... As we did this week, we'll start with Dubai, where Simona Halep beats Rybakina in the final. Right. We were recently corrected about the pronunciation of her name by Elena herself. Thank you for that. I mean, she didn't, you know, correct us personally, but we were able to hear her pronounce her own name. But Rybakina has been doing crazy things in the first few months of this year. She's been doing the most every day of the week. Right. She's won 21 matches. She won Hobart. She beat Karolina Pliskova, the Australian Open winner, Sofia Kennan, Petra Martic, and lost a thrilling final to Simona Halep in Dubai. Top 20 now. Her rise has been meteoric. Mm-hmm. And the way she's doing it is just so undramatic, right? Like, if you get a fist pump from her, it's a lot. She wins a tournament and she's just walking to the net. She's like, you know... <laughs> I guess I'll be having cool. like a hundred more of these. This right. ain't no thing. <laughs> right. In, uh, in the men's tournaments that week in Marseille, Stefano Tsitsipas beats Felix Auger Aliasim. Felix reaches his second straight final. Unfortunately, loses his, sec- his second straight final. He also lost to Monfils in Montpellier and is now 0 and 5 in ATP finals, he which, made- you know, people are, some people are a little upset about, but. Because he hasn't played particularly well in those finals. But, you know, he's 19. He's got time. He made three finals last year, a further two so far this year. Felix is is still on the come up. Like, the development is still happening in real time. Mm-hmm. Like, he's, he's putting himself in the right positions. He may not be excelling when he gets there. You hope that the trajectory of his career is higher than, one, than somebody like Gael Mofis? But if you were to look to Mofis, you'd see a lot of hope for Felix because Mofis has one of the worst records in finals that you'll imagine. But he's, <laughs> right. he's starting to make good on that in the last couple of years. Mm. But, you know, has put together a, a great career. And he's 33 years old and he's still going, winning two titles in a row. And then this week, making the semifinals in Dubai because the men are in Dubai this week. Mm. In Delray Beach, we have Riley Opelka beating Yoshi Nishioka. Nishioka made a joke on court, because if you remember last year at some point, he had said in his on-court speech, uh, remember my name, it's Nishioka, not Nishikori. 
Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, I think you remember my name now, but even still, you can just call me Yoshi. Because there was this great bit uh, from Delray Beach put together by the, the media folks there, headlined by the wonderful Blair Henley, where they did a Mario Kart kind of golf cart segment. Yes, it was him, uh, Steve Johnson, and who else? And somebody else. Apologies to that man. We know him. <laughs> I forgot. But we have just forgotten. But Yoshi comes out with an actual Yoshi head from, like, Mario Kart. Mm-hmm. And he kills it. He wins mm-hmm. easily. So now he wants us to know that he is Yoshi. <laughs> and in Rio de Janeiro, we got really one of the strangest 500 level draws you're ever going to see. This is an, kind of an odd clay event to be of 500, in my opinion. Dominic team was there and was expected to win. You know, if Rafa's not there, Dominic is going to clean up all the clay titles. But team lost to the number 128 player, Italian Gianluca Majer. And in the semifinals, Majer plays 106, Attila Balas from Hungary. So that's one semi. On the other side, we have Garin and Choric, which is a more predictable semifinal and a clay event. Garin beats Chorich, beats Majer in the final, and wins the second straight clay title and his fourth title in the past 10 months. Garin now inside the ATP Top 20. He looked in great form again this week in Santiago, but eventually had to retire from his match. Yeah, it's been a lot of tennis for him, and I assume he only played in Chile because it's his home country. So this week, we're in Acapulco. Venus goes to Acapulco. Sloan is there. Both of them lose in their first match. The draw comes out, folks are like, oh my god, Venus and Sloan in the quarterfinals. You hate to see it. Maybe you love to see it. Well, and, and it's not an incredibly strong draw. So no, it's like, oh, not at Venus, all. oh my god, Venus 50, like she could really do it here. Listen, the final is Heather Watson versus Leila Annie Fernandez. Right. Like this was not a super duper tough draw. Venus draws Kaya Yuvan in the first round, is down a break in both sets 4 2, wins the first set. Has triple break points at 5-4 to win the match. Triple match point. Eventually loses seven match points and then goes away in the third. This was bad, Mm y'all. This was not good. It was not great. It was good up until those first three match points went away, frankly. Mm -hmm. Like, Venus didn't look bad out there until that point. And so, again, she's lost in the first round. She's not getting match play. And she's off to Monterey now, where she's going to play a qualifier in the first round. A Monterey tournament that has Kim Kleisters, that has Victoria Azarenka coming back. Kleisters draws Joe Conta in the first round. All eyes will be on that. I have Monday and Tuesday off, baby. I'll be watching. (laughs) But back to Acapulco, the good news is we have a few Cinderella stories, right? So a Mexican player, number 270 in the world, Renata Sarasua makes the semifinals in her home country. Good pronunciation there. Oh, thank you. Because there's an accent on the U. Yes. So it's Sarasua. Believe me, yeah. I looked this up. And Sarasua. Also, like in Italian, the, the Zs are pronounced differently than in Spanish, so i got to be careful. Um, she beat Sloan in round one. And of course, at the time, it was seen as like, oh my God, what the hell, Sloan? Because, but, it, was, because it was like, well, Sloan could really lose to anybody. Mm-hmm. But like... But like the number 270? Really? Is it really going to happen? Mm-hmm. But they're still making the jokes, not really thinking it would happen. And then it happens in straight sets. Right. But this low-ranked player did beat a bunch of other people. Gets to the semifinals in Acapulco. Loses to Leila Annie Fernandez, who is a 17-year-old Canadian who won the French Open Juniors last year. And from my you know, brief research, correct me if I'm wrong, these are her first WTA main draw victories this week and she's made it all the way to the final stick your neck out there if you want right. i have not she fact check that she, i don't know she has won matches at fed cup that's the the caveat but at wta level tournaments these are her first wins if you're out there listening to the podcast and you're like wow another fucking canadian like how many are there like this is the last one for now well and also layla has a sister too so for we, now. We, <laughs> this is the last one for now. <laughs> right. Of the top tier talent in the junior level, this is the last one to like be birthed onto yeah. the main tours. And who is Layla going to play in the final but Hev Watson? I'm so happy for this. I'm so, mm-hmm. so pleased. 
have is back up in the live rankings to number 55. If she wins the final, she'll be back inside the top 50. And her career high is number 38. So mm-hmm. she was out there in the tennis wilderness for a while. Oh, yeah. And she started making strides to, at the end of last year, and she's well and truly back. Doha, which uh, traded places with Dubai this year. Doha is the premier five this year, right? It's worth 900 points. We had a, a stacked, a stacked draw. The semis presented a, a great cross section of the WTA these days. So we have number one Barty playing Kvitova. For the ninth time. Mm-hmm. They we played have, a lot in, in recent years. We have Kuznetsova, who refuses to go away, versus Arena Sabalenka. So Kvitova takes out Barty in almost two hours and three sets. They've played, I think, nine times, and it is now 5 4 Kvitova, I think. Arena Sabalenka is just battering the tennis ball. In the final today, it looked like Petra was not exactly 100%, took a medical timeout in the second set, had the second semifinal yesterday, so may have been a little bit worn out from that. But Sabalenka just pushed her around. I mean, just the pace and the speed of her ball when it's accurate is oppressive. And Kvitova no I thought you said impressive there for a second. No, but it's, it's like it's oppressive. oppressive. Okay. Like it hurts. And Kvitova knows how to do that to other people. Ash Barty makes a semifinal. Cute result. I think what we're seeing from here... <laughs> no, it is. I think what we're seeing from her now is... Consistent. A consistent, comfortable relationship with the number one ranking. Yeah. Where yeah. she's not going to be having these shocking early round losses. She's going to do her bit. She's going to win matches. She took out Muguruza. She could have won that match against Kvitova. Didn't happen. Not the end of the world. But she's still giving herself chances. Mm-hmm. And she's going to be number one for a while, at least through the French Open at yeah. this rate. Yeah. Ons Shabur is the other big story from Doha. So the highest ranked Arab woman in tennis history, the first Arab woman to make the quarterfinals in Doha, she beat Karolina Pliskova this week, the number two seed. She also beat Siniakova and Jennifer Brady, who's been on an absolute tear. One of my picks to have a breakout mm-hmm. this year, Jennifer Brady. And only loses to Petra Kvitova in a close match and two tie breaks. Like this confidence that she garnered from the Australian Open is really pushing her forward because the game is there. Like she has weapons to confuse and annoy people. She's not just one of these slice and dice folks. Mm. She can do that, but she can also hit with power. She's got an all court, all purpose game. She can do it all. And she's out here hitting aces. Something I saw on Twitter this week. Courtney Nguyen tweeted that what's really cool about Ans Jabour right now is that we are witnessing trailblazing in motion, in mm-hmm. action, in real time. And people actually seem to to realize it. You yeah. know, it's not something that you look back and say, oh, wow, she did that. So like we're actually acknowledging what she's doing now. One of the cooler things you'll see as a tennis fan is tuning in this past week to the Doha tournament and watching Ans Jabour deliver the goods on that center court with that crowd Mm -hmm. knowing the context and the stakes and what she's doing as the first it's it's amazing truly is but she actually apologized to Pliskova and asked the fans to like tone it down a little because this is not football this is tennis (laughs) it's fine girl it's fine (laughs) it's fine like given the chance Pliskova would be like hacking you to death out there Mm -hmm. with a a chainsaw so that was a reference to the lumberjacking of the the chair umpire Mm mm-hmm that, that, that's what that was. In Dubai, Novak Djokovic is never going to lose. So I mean, he just told us on court today <laughs> that his goal, one of his goals, is to go undefeated on the air. And he was like, I'm just, co- I'm just kidding. But I'm not. Actually, I'm not. Not at all. So we've got 21 matches in a row. Beat Tsitsipas pretty easily in the final. Gael Mofis was not easy at all. No. It looked... For most of that match, that Mulfiz was about to notch his very first win against Novak Djokovic. And then... Listen, <laughs> I was watching that match when I got up, but then I had to go to work. And Mulfiz was struggling to hold to get into that second set tiebreak. And then he did. Mm-hmm. And then he was up 6-3 in the second set tiebreak. Up a set 6-2, three match points in the second set tiebreak. And I scripted a tweet. I know a lot of y'all drafted tweets. I'm not going to expose you, but 
it tickled me. I mean, it was... Not because of the result, but the fact that you put that much faith in Novak Djokovic not coming back. No, it wasn't and that. And Mofi's not... And Mofi's actually pulling that out. It wasn't that. Everybody knows Djokovic's capabilities. It was more about the goodwill that Gael has built up mm. and wanting this for him. You know, like the guy yeah. deserves it. Like you lose 15 times in a row to a dude <laughs> and then you have the chance, three chances to make this happen after you fought so hard. You are the guy that people have made so much fun of throughout your career mm. that you have French brain. You can't do this. It'll never happen. And you have put in the work. It's been two years now of Gael Mofis being a top, consistent tennis player reworking the narrative of his career and you get to this point that could be one more rung up the ladder climb up the mountain he just finished talking about how you know it's unlikely i'll ever win a french open but hell like i gotta believe that i still can you know like Mm -hmm. this this could have been so much for him and i think a lot of folks wanted it for him and that's where i was coming from it had nothing to do with novak and nothing to do with not expecting Novak to be able to pull this out because I think I can say in all of our minds, we're like, this is, this is stupid. You should not be writing this right now. But I was pressed for time. I had to jump in the shower and get to work. I was like, I need to have this ready to go. And then of course you look at the score and you just, all you can do is laugh at that point, because like, this is what we expect. This Mm. is Novak Djokovic. This is who he is. He is impregnable. He is the ultimate count me out. If you dare. It's been interesting to watch because, like, he hasn't actually been playing lights out total in the zone tennis for all of it. But he has worked on parts of his game that he will probably need as he gets older. Like, he's better at short points now. He reworked his serve, as we talked about after the Australian Open. And as he gets slower and has less endurance going into his mid-30s, these are the things, like, he has that foresight and it's working now. So 21 match win streak is only his seventh best of his career. Mm. How is that possible? In Acapulco, where the men are playing as well, alongside the women, Rafael Nadal is in the final against, I was about to say Taylor Swift, Taylor Fritz. (laughs) For me, Rafael's looked good this week. He was a little bit scrappy in his first match. But his semifinal against Grigor, all of their hardcourt matches have gone three sets, and this one did not. Or at least Grigor has won at least one set. It's never been oh, straight sorry. sets on right. hardcore. That's what I meant. Because they've played at slams. Yeah. But uh, Grigor brought it. Grigor tried it. Grigor did many things. And Rafa had every single answer. Yeah. It was an impressive result for Nadal last night. Taylor Fritz takes out John Isner. Let's celebrate In the that. semifinals. Coming from a set down. That is, that is not nothing. Okay. Quickly. We got a few more things to cover quickly. Roger Federer announced that he's having knee surgery. He will be out for the entire clay swing, and he hopes to be back for Wimbledon. That was a shocker. Yeah. I mean, the timing of this, it seemed like maybe Federer looked at his schedule and was like, well, I have all these commitments. Where am I going to fit this in? Still got to do my off-season We Are the World Tour. Still got to do the Australian Open. And then also this big exhibition with Rafa in South Africa that had been planned for such a long time that this was the only time that he could really... This was a smart time for him to yeah, do it. Yeah. If he missed the clay season as much as he enjoyed it last year, does he need to be swept up in a Wizard of Oz tornado like he did last year in the semifinals Hell of Roland no. Garros? Like, who is about that life? <laughs> it also sucks for Federer because it just so happens that he has a lot of points to defend in this stretch. I believe finals in Indian Wells... And a W in Miami. Miami and a semifinal at the French Open. So mm-hmm. at least for Wimbledon, like his the uh, seeding process will get him in a pretty good position because of his past grass results. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking yeah. about should he be playing, you know, into his 40th year, what his <laughs> ranking will look like and all the people who will be unfortunate to have to play Federer in round of well, 16s right. in quarterfinals when they normally wouldn't. Mm. And I guess that works for Federer as well, right. that he will have to play them. Andrew Murray issued a health update because there's been some mystery surrounding his absence. He has a heterotopic ossification. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I did look up what this was. That sounds homophobic. 
Yep. Why is it hetero? <laughs> why why got to be hetero all the time? I don't know. I don't know. I didn't look into the etymology, but what it is, it's it's a bone growth in soft tissue. Um, so often it's bone growth in a muscle near the hip, which is very common in people who've had surgeries like this. It is less common for it to be symptomatic, however. So basically a piece of bone is growing in a muscle around where the hip surgery was. But for most people, they don't have symptoms. They probably don't know what's happening. It may need surgery to remove the ossification. However, it's common that this thing can grow back after surgery. So we're in kind of a pickle here. So Andy is not committing. He's saying he wants to play Miami, but is not sure. If it does need surgery, he'll be out for a while. It's a relatively short recovery. Mm -hmm. Um, It'll be like four, six, eight weeks, whatever, but probably not more than that. So he's back on the on the practice course now to see how his body will respond to that. But he also can't do the surgery now, even if he wanted to, because he's not sure that the bone has stopped growing. Correct. Right. Which also which means you're just gonna need another surgery yeah. if it is causing these problems. And apparently in people who have this, it can cause swelling, joint pain, um, fever in the early stages. A lot of times it's just treated with NSAIDs, you know, like non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. Or there's this local radiation therapy, but we are talking about a professional athlete here. So joint mobility is integral Mm -hmm. to his recovery. And the reason why he has to wait for this bone to to finish growing is because if he goes in and takes it out now, it'll just grow back. Until the bone is finished growing, it'll keep coming back. Right. That little segment there was entitled health. And now this little segment, the header for it is called what? Mess. Mess. Mm -hmm. Because there's been a lot of mess. We didn't mention this in the agenda, but Tsitsipas and the whole Tsitsipas family drama, it's too much. Keep this shit out of the press. Who needs to see it? Why is your mom in the press room? Why are you complaining about your familial relations in the press room? Like, I am cringing from secondhand embarrassment about this. Like, dude, you just finished almost whacking your father to death at the ATP Cup. Like, this is not it. Let's let's keep the Tsitsipas stuff. I would say that, that is slightly hyperbolic, but... <laughs> I'm just saying, if this is the rehab of the image in that mm-hmm. regard, it's failed. I would, I would say um, it's just, it's no small wonder that Stephanos is the way Stephanos is. And I may regret saying that. I'm not going to touch that with any length pole. <laughs> Because I want okay. y'all to know Jonathan Newman. Yes, he was not part of that. I was not part of that. Nick Kyrgios. Mm-hmm. So Nick Kyrgios hasn't really made a lot of news on the court recently, but he's made a lot of news with his social media antics. Yeah, he's pulled out of a couple of events, was in Delray, didn't play because of injury eventually, made it to Acapulco where he's the defending champion. And so the pressure on him to actually show up and play there is it's greater than, than Delray Beach, right? Mm-hmm. And even though, according to him, he was not well enough to play, he put the, the effort into it, showed up, did the press obligations, but eventually having to retire in his first round match because he couldn't do it. And the crowd starts booing him. Right. Let's be very clear that that's not cool. No. that That's not cool. But Nick responded with this... Instagram story, which is really his chosen form of response these days, with the middle finger emoji and says, no wonder this country doesn't have any good players. While Miss Sarasua is lighting it up, right? Right, right. Uh, So my take here is that Nick has never found a situation where he couldn't go lower. You know, like when he's given the opportunity to be great, he often does. When he finds an opportunity to do good things, to, to raise money, f- to stick up for causes he thinks are important, he does those. He goes above and beyond. But when he's faced with negativity, he has never failed to take the bait, to go even lower. No, it's like you see that fork in the road, and it's like, yes or mess. And <laughs> I am going the, to choose mess every time. It's the gravity pull. It just like, he's walking toward yes, and his body just is taken away. Yes. Mrs. Obama said, when they go low, Nick Kyrgios goes lower every on inst- time. On Instagram. And then deletes it. This was the same week where he was complaining about the draw at the 500 level. The real draw. That, yes. 
at players who he did not think were deserving gaining all these points for winning yeah. matches on a clay tournament because it's the wrong time of year and da, da, da. and he says hashtag exterminate the clay rats you know it's really never a good time to use genocidal language but especially now i would argue there's that there's <laughs> definitely that and then there's also maybe you wouldn't feel this way if you yourself were better at clay like, if you would take the time to try and be better at yes. clay. Aside from all the like social and political implications of extermination, there's also the the logical fallacy happening here that that's just not a good faith argument. Like team took a loss to this clay rat. Right. Right. right? In in Curios. Uh, in Curios' yeah. parlance. Mm-hmm. This clay rat beat Dominic team, the right. second best clay court of the last couple of years. And somebody who's taken a set off of Rafa Nadal in a French Open final. This clay rat did that. And anyone you feel is more deserving of these points was free to enter this tournament. They sure were. And earn those points and that money. Like mm-hmm. you you were also free to enter that tournament. You're just I mean, you are not good on clay and you hate it. And which so is you, fine. And so you but choose to play honest, Delray Beach every year be instead. Honest. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Completely Uh, absurd. um, Some people, one person in particular, is very upset that Bublik doesn't like tennis. (laughs) Carol Bouchard (laughs) gave one of the most perplexing opinions on Twitter about Mr. Bublik. This made me laugh so hard. She writes, Thanking Tennis Universe that I don't have to sit through a Bublik press conference often. And when he keeps saying how he only plays for the money, he should kiss the feet of the top players who did the job on and off the court in order for him to raise the bar of his bank account. I definitely sympathize with not wanting to sit through certain press conferences (laughs) because they're not always that pleasant. However, a tennis player, like anyone, is not really required to love their job or be positive when talking about their job. It's It's a weird job, right? Being a professional athlete. Because you have to do it, and then you are obligated to come talk about it yeah. afterward. I mean, I hate my job, but I also don't make a lot of money at my job. So nobody would bat an eye at me saying that, right? right. This is where... And there isn't like a whole group of people asking you to discuss your job after your shift. Yeah, and right? nobody's really coveting my job. <laughs> nobody's over right. here like, well, damn, I wish I could be so-and-so. Mm. <laughs> right? yeah, like, yeah. Whereas people are like, well, damn, I would love to just... I would love to just, right? It's always just. I'd love to just play sports and make millions of right. dollars. It is It is really, really difficult. And that's why there are not a lot of people doing it at this level. <laughs> What's weird to me is like the kissing the top player's feet. I don't know how much younger players owe their predecessors. And certainly not in that language. How much did those three kiss the feet of Sam and Agassi and then... Edberg, Borg, mm. Becker, McEnroe before them. You know, yeah. like it's It's odd. I it's strange. I understand that being an athlete is not a normal job, but it it is indeed a job. And it is work. And you are certainly doing labor that has value. So the idea that you have to love it to me is incongruous with work. Mm. And also, are we just giving the big three too much credit for the the incredible increase in prize money across the board at the top levels of tennis in the last mm. decade and a half possibly i don't know if if it's all them you know like at the end of the day tennis is still a niche sport and for us a lot of those prize monies are just pissing contests we talked about this on the last episode and then finally the last mess is this thing with naomi clapping back against a twitter user who was who put up a poll about what are the most embarrassing wild cards. And Mario Osaka was one of the options. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's actually, it's actually not like the most heinous example of somebody talking about a tennis player's family member. But I certainly don't begrudge Naomi for for having an opinion and sharing it. Like, yeah. that's your family. Yeah. You know? She tweeted in response and then deleted it. A lot of the tennis Twitter people are, they will poke, 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 poke. And then when they get clapped... They're really sensitive. It's like, how how could you do this? And and to me, that's gaslighting, right? Like you say all manner of mess about somebody because they're famous and you think they're not reading your stuff. 
But when they do clap back, you get all sensitive about it. Naomi tweeted, your existence is a, your existence is embarrassing. Don't mention my sister ever. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can relate. That would be me. That would totally be me. I would say something in anger, especially if you're coming for a member of my family. I have done it before, in person. Listen, we see top players using their influence to get family member stuff all the time. Mr. Djokovic, yeah. Mr. Harrison. Why is Christian Harrison still getting things? I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's a wild card into qualifying. There's an IMG connection. Like, it wasn't surprising to me. Maybe surprising would have been a better word. Embarrassing. Eh. This idea that Naomi shouldn't clap back. That I, I mean, she's a former number one, two-time slam champion. One of the biggest female athletes in the world right now. But she still got family in her veins. Mm-hmm. There's a lot I want to say about this, and I don't know that I should get into it here. <laughs> okay. Because we predicted this. We saw it coming. Oh, I see what you're saying. In the 2018 U.S. Open, we knew, we knew that a lot of people were using Naomi as a prop in bad faith. And as soon as that docile black girl that they wanted to to prop up as this innocent victim, as soon as she became human, they start tearing her down for the stupidest reasons. And you'll see, I said at the time, we both said at the time, you're going to see it. It just wasn't out of pocket for me. It just just simply wasn't. wasn't. It wasn't. Mikhail Yushning. <laughs> Some of these guys, really, they cannot compliment their favorite female tennis players without tearing down women's tennis in general. He said, so he wrote a poem. I'm so glad somebody sent me the original uh, Cyrillic script because it was in a series of quatrains, very artistic. And he said over and over and over as a refrain, we, what did he say? Like We, we will no, we longer, will no watch. longer watch women's tennis <laughs> because Maria's retiring and he said it like four times it was like misha we get it we get it you don't care about women's tennis if maria is not playing she's great got it cool but like is women's tennis that bad without her do i need friends like this Mm -hmm. he's out here saying maria you are daenerys no dragons burn that shit down (laughs) (laughs) maria probably left that one on red can you imagine he sent her like a 16 line poem about women's tennis and about Masha? And she was probably like, Jesus Christ. I'm just trying to live out here in South Florida. Can you imagine the woman who had him slide up in their DMs at some point and the mess that he would have said to them thinking it's romantic? <laughs> <laughs> Enough of that. Okay. And, and finally, some not so great news. A kind of a tonal shift here. Jeannie Everett Dubin who is Chrissy Everett's sister, passed away at age 62 of ovarian cancer. Uh, Jeannie was ranked at one point number 28 in the world on the WTA tour. She was a junior number one. She and her sister Chrissy played doubles together in the 1970s and got all the way to the number four ranking. By age 15 in 1973, she was touted as, you know, the next Chrissy Everett, (laughs) as Chrissy Everett's talented sister. She had wins over Margaret Court against Rosie Casals, and her career took a very different path than Chrissy's. She played for a very short time. She left the tour in 1978. She married, had children. She settled in Delray Beach with her husband, who founded the Delray Beach Tennis Center, and Jeannie had a very active role managing it. She was coaching there, and then after her husband's passing, she was the owner of the Delray Beach Tennis Center. Or condolences to Chrissy and the entire Everett family. A few retirements. Vania King will play her final match in Charleston, where she'll partner Shvedova on, in doubles. She did the social media update saying, Hey guys, I know a lot of y'all probably assumed I was retired already because I haven't really done much in the last couple of years. But this is what will be happening. I'll be playing this final match in Charleston. And then you'll see me around in Indian Wells and Miami as well. We also got a retirement announcement from Joanna Larson. Who was just like, hey guys, I have already retired. (laughs) Update. So there are so many different ways to do this. And finally, uh, a small update on the GoFundMe prizes and postcards. We have mailed out nearly every single postcard. We will finish the rest uh, this weekend. But the prizes have all been mailed out. So you never know. Check your mail. Right. Day by day, something could appear. So in about three weeks, if you don't have a postcard, 
let us know because that's a male problem, not an us problem. Yeah. And we will fix it. If you've donated $100 or more, think about whether you'd like to submit a player for our book report segment. It is a retired player. Mm -hmm. And we'll do a little research and a little body serve spin on that. And there are a bunch of other crowdfunding projects going on at the moment. You've given us so much and we thank you. We also want to, to pay it forward a little bit by bigging up some of the other content producers in tennis. Yeah. So No Challenges Remaining has launched a Patreon. That's you how can it's pronounced? Pa Patreon? Is it Patreon? I don't know. I thought it was anyway. Patreon. And this, is a, this is a legitimate oh, question. Oh, no, you're right. Be so you can become a patron and you can donate a, a fixed amount per month. That's how that works. Lindsay Gibbs has been running this Power Plays newsletter for a few months now and has just launched a subscription model. Reem Abilil, who is in many ways the voice of Arab tennis in the Western world, under review with Craig Shapiro and Tennis with an Accent. A lot of folks out here hustling. We may not always see eye to eye with everybody. Like, I mean, there's a lot of folks who pr produce stuff in tennis that were like, well, you know, that's just not for me. But like us, they're out here hustling and they're, I think, deserving of coins. You know, like this stuff is not cheap. It's not easy. It takes a lot of time. And wherever you can, help out these folks as much as you can. And we also thank you for your generosity. Thanks for listening to episode 188. We're still arguing over titles. No, I think you've decided. Okay. You want to go with it's Sharapova. You It's pronounced Sharapova. <laughs> wow, that's so evil that you would say over. Wow. Oh Rude. my god. <laughs> I was just going to go with I know. it's a it's a complicated affair. I felt that was a little bit stayed and a little bit bland. Well, it was there was no it's it was a complicated affair. I thought it was very simple mm. and classy. You decided to be simple and not classy. Okay, we'll see if I pull the trigger when I put this episode out. Because you'll be editing it, it. Yeah. Thanks for listening. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Overcast. Uh, leave us a review if you are so inclined. On Twitter, I am James at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's. I'm Jonathan. You can find me on Twitter at tennis underscore John. And we are on Twitter and Instagram at The Body Surf. Thanks for listening. Till next time. Thank you very much.